Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Today I wanted to go over something that comes up so often with the people that I tutor, and that is logic statements. Now, these are really useful for all the entrance exams like STEP or TMUA or MAT, anything like that. But what kind of logic statements am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about likes of if and only if and necessary and sufficient conditions. Now, these are really useful for all your kind of proofs as there's a little bit of a difference between if versus only if and then between necessary and sufficient conditions. So if you're ready, let's get into it, starting with if and only if. Well, it's actually two different statements. So let's first take the example, why if and only if x. So the first statement is pretty straightforward. It's that y is true if x is true. Y if x. Now the second statement is that y can only be true if x is true. Y only if x. This means that there is no other possible way that we can get y other than having x be true. So I'll just repeat, if we know that y is true, the only way that we can have y being true is if x was true. So if y is true, then x must also be true. I'll repeat that again. If y is true, x must also be true. So we've essentially proved it two ways. The first statement is that y if x the second statement is x if y. Okay, so now we can use some of this maths notation to simplify it down a bit. So what we can do is say that x implies y with this double arrow for the first statement, and then for the second statement, y implies x. And now we can even combine them with our if and only if statement to say that x double arrow y. So it's a bi-directional thing. x implies y, y implies x. Okay, so now let's take it to a real world example. Let's take the statement, you can ride the roller coaster if and only if you are over four feet tall. Let's again break it down into the two statements that we had previously. The first one being, you can ride the roller coaster if you are over four feet tall. Pretty straightforward. Second one, you can ride the roller coaster only if you are over four feet tall. So only if you are over four feet tall can you get on this roller coaster. This means being over four foot tall is the only way that you can get on that roller coaster. So what does the reverse argument actually say? Well, it says that there is no other way for you to be on the roller coaster other than being over four foot tall. It's the absolute only way. So again, going back to the math logic, we can write these statements as, if you're over four foot tall, you can get on the roller coaster. If you're on the roller coaster, you must be over four foot tall. So we've got that powerful logic built up. This is our if and only if statement written in math logic. But now, why is this actually useful to us? Well, this logic can be quite powerful because if I tell you a person cannot get on the roller coaster, you immediately know that they must be under four foot tall. So you know a fact about them straight away, one thing implies another thing. If they can get on the roller coaster, you know they must be over four foot. And you know the other way around, if they're under four foot, they cannot get on the roller coaster. Okay, now let's bring in a bit more of a mathematical example. Prove that x squared minus x minus six is less than zero if and only if x is between minus two and three. So now what we need to do is prove this both ways and prove that the only way to have x squared minus x minus six less than zero is with x between minus two and three. So first let's sketch y equals x squared minus x minus six. Way to do this is by factorizing it, and then it's an easy sketch from there, just sketching it as a quadratic. So let's do the first direction of logic. Let's assume that x is between minus two and three. Then we need to assure that x squared minus x minus six is less than zero. Now looking at our graph, we can see if I have x between these two regions, then x squared minus x minus six, our graph is definitely less than zero. So that's perfect, prove the first one. Now, to prove the only if statement, we need to prove it backwards. We need to assume that x squared minus x minus six is less than zero, and then show that x is between minus two and three. Okay, so let's look at when the graph is less than zero. Well, it's only less than zero between these two points. Therefore, what are these two points? Well, from my earlier sketch, that's minus two and three. So therefore, we've shown the only if statement. Therefore, we can clearly see the statement is correct x squared minus x minus six is less than zero if and only if 
x is between minus 2 and 3. Both directions work. There is no other x's for which this graph is less than 0. OK, so another example. Let's consider the statement x squared equals 9 if and only if x equals 3. Now, is this a correct statement like the last one? Let's break it down. Start by assuming x equals 3. Then, yeah, it's pretty easy to show x squared equals 9. So we can already say that x squared equals 9 if x equals 3. What about the reverse statement? Let's start by assuming x squared equals 9. And then do we definitely get x equals 3? Well, if I square root both sides, I actually get x equals plus or minus 3. So we don't know that x definitely equals 3. In fact, we have two solutions. So I can't say that the only solution to x squared equals 9 is 3. So therefore, it is not a correct if and only if statement. It's a correct if statement, but not an if and only if. OK, so how should you approach a question in the exam if you get asked about if and only if? Well, if the question asks something about if and only if, for example, why if and only if, to prove the if part, you first assume x is true and then need to prove that y must be true. And if you want to disprove it, you need something like a counterexample to disprove it. Now, to prove the only if statement, you need to do the opposite. Assume y is true and prove x is true. Again, can disprove it with a counterexample. And then if you have both ways, then it must be an if and only if statement. And that's what you want to do in the exam. If they ask you to prove it's an if, one direction. If you want to prove it's only if, the other direction. If and only if needs to be both directions. So that's if and only if. But make sure to stay to the end because I'm going to be doing a past TMUA question that kind of really highlights what you want to be doing in an exam. But for now, if you don't mind, it would be really helpful if you could hit that subscribe button. It lets me know that you like this kind of content where I'm talking through different ideas. And it also means that I'm reaching more people and helping more people with their maths. Thank you very much. I'll continue with the video now. OK, so going on to necessary and sufficient conditions. You might be sat there thinking, oh, well, these are really different from the ones we've just done on if and only if. However, realistically, they're exactly the same. An if statement is the same as a sufficient condition and a necessary condition is the same as an only if statement. But just be careful because they're often written the other way around. Before we had y if and only if x and here we have x is a sufficient and necessary condition for y. The English language means that the way that they're written is the opposite way around. So just be careful about that and you're actually proving it the other way. So we're going to start with this example, which is having a driving license is a necessary and sufficient condition to drive in the UK. OK, so it's sufficient because if you have a driving license, you can drive in the UK. That, that's the way it works. If you have one, you're allowed to drive. So it's a sufficient condition to drive in the UK. And then next is necessary. The only way that you're allowed to drive in the UK is if you have a driving license. No other way to, to be able to drive on the roads. You have to have a driving license. It is a necessary condition. And we can use the same logic that we applied in the only if example, which is if I see you driving on the roads, I know that you must have a driving license. So we can apply the backwards logic. So again, we can say having a license implies you can drive. You can drive implies you have a license. So we can get that bi-directional logic once again. See how it's the same as if and only if? The two align quite closely. OK, now we've done the real world. I'm going to use the same example that we did before, which is to do with x squared equals 9 and x equals 3. So x equals 3 is a sufficient condition to have x squared equals 9. If we have x equals 3, I can prove to you that x squared equals 9. So we start from x equals 3 and show that x squared equals 9. So that's a sufficient condition, but it's not a necessary condition. I could have x equals minus 3. That would also give me x squared equals 9. So I don't necessarily need x equals 3. It's where the, the phrasing comes from. Now, showing you the other way around, uh, x between minus 4 and 4 is a necessary condition for x squared equals 9. I know that because from earlier I've proved that both solutions are between minus 4 and 4. But it isn't a sufficient condition because if x is between that, x equals 2, by my logic, should be a solution. It isn't because I know that 2 squared is 4. So x being between minus 4 and 4 is a necessary condition, but it is not sufficient to get the answer. I know it must be between them, but I don't. it doesn't give me the right answer. And then also going back to our other example on the quadratic, x being between minus 2 and 3 is a necessary and sufficient condition for x squared minus x minus 6 to be less than 0. Now, 
it's sufficient because if I take minus two, less than x, less than three, then we know by our graph that x squared minus x minus six must be less than zero because our graph is lower than x equals zero between these two positions. Now it is a necessary condition because if we have x squared minus x minus six less than zero, then from our graph, we must have x between minus two and three. So it is necessary. We have to have it. There's no other way to get x squared minus x minus six less than zero. So again, what do you actually do if a question asks you about necessary and sufficient conditions? Well, let's take the same example. X is a sufficient and necessary condition for Y. Now, if you can assume X and prove Y, then it is a sufficient condition. If you can assume Y and prove X, then it is a necessary condition. If you can prove both, then X is both a necessary and sufficient condition. So again, X to Y implies sufficient, y to x implies necessary, and proving both is necessary and sufficient. Okay, so let's go on to a few examples from a TMUA paper. First one's on if and only if. Now, if you've never got this, please just pause the video and then come back and see if we got the same answer. So the thing with TMUA is they're all multiple choice, so there's possibility of three answers. So they've given us the curves, two to the power x equals mx plus c. So first off, I wanna be thinking about the intersection between the curves two to the power x and a random line y equals mx plus c. Don't know what it looks like. Two random constants, I don't know. So which of the following statements is slash r true? So I'm gonna break these down in and show what I need to prove for each of them. So let's take it slow and let's look at the first one. The equation has negative real solution only if c is greater than one. So because it's an only if statement, we want to assume that it has one negative real solution and prove that C must be greater than one. So we can simplify what we have to do here and we have to either prove that with one negative real solution, we must have C greater than one or disprove it with a counter example. Okay, so statement two says that the equation has two distinct real solutions if C is greater than one. So it's an if statement. We need to start from C greater than one and prove that there is two distinct real solutions. So C greater than one implies two distinct real solutions. We again either need to prove that or disprove it. Okay, statement three. The equation has two distinct real positive solutions if and only if C is less than or equal to one. So again, this time we need to prove it both ways. We need to assume it has C less than or equal to one and prove that there must be two distinct real solutions. And we must also assume there's two distinct real positive solutions and prove that C is less than or equal to one. Again, or for both these statements, we can disprove them with a counter example. Okay, so going back to one, we'll now try and actually prove whether this is true or false. Okay, so first off, we've got to sketch the two equations. We've got two to the power x and mx plus c. Now, we're assuming that it has a negative real solution, and then we need to prove that c must be greater than one. Well, this is what they're looking for. They're looking for this kind of curve, which does have a negative real solution. However, if I draw one with a negative gradient, with m being negative, I can have a negative real solution and I can have C less than one. So this statement is not true. One negative real solution does not mean that I have to have C greater than one. I've disproved it by counter example. Okay, moving on to statement two. So first off, we need to assume that C is greater than one and prove that there must be two distinct real solutions. So if C is greater than one, well, I can have a line that looks like this with a positive gradient and there would be two distinct real solutions. However, again, looking at a negative gradient and C is greater than or equal to one, I can have a line that only has one solution. So this is also incorrect and I've disproved it again by counter example. Okay, now, so I think I kind of see the pattern here and I'm gonna have a look at statement number three, which is I need to prove it both ways. And now if either way I can disprove, then the whole statement is incorrect. So I'm just gonna pick one and I'm gonna assume that C is less than or equal to one and potentially disprove that there doesn't have to be two distinct real positive solutions. Okay, well, I think that should be somewhat easy. Again, negative gradient. So I'll draw a negative gradient where the y-intercept is minus two, say, and again, C, there is only one solution. So I've again disproved three by counter example. So the correct answer for this is A, none of the options. Okay, so you can kind of see how I'm now breaking down these if and only if statements, and I'm gonna do the same when necessary and sufficient. 
Okay, so again, another question on necessary and sufficient conditions. Again, if you want to have a go at it, pause the video, have a quick go at it, and then come back and see if we got the same answer. So, this one is based on necessary and sufficient conditions rather than if and only if, but the logic should still stand. So we've got two statements here. A list consists of n integers, and then p, the first statement is that n is odd, and the second statement is the median of the list is one of the numbers in the list. So you think about mid and medians, you kind of cancel off from either side until you get to the middle. If there's two in the middle, you, you go halfway between. If there's only one in the middle, you just take that one. Kind of how the median works. So which of the following is true? P is necessary and sufficient for Q. So that means P implies Q and Q implies P. So we want bi-directional there. So P is necessary, but not sufficient for Q. So by necessary, that's Q implies P. And then I also want to prove that P does not imply Q. So I want it backwards, but not forwards. C is that P is sufficient, but not necessary, which means that P implies Q, but Q does not imply P. So it's just the forward logic, not the backwards logic. And then D is neither or. So do you want to prove P to Q or Q to P? So again, I'll either prove these or I can disprove it with a counterexample. And again, it's only TMUA, so you don't need to prove it in too much detail because we're only picking a right answer. So first off, I'm going to start by assuming P and implying Q. So that is sufficient. Now, going from P to Q, I'm going to assume that N is odd, but then does the median of the list have to be one of the numbers in the list? Well, if you think about how medians work, you cancel off one from each side until you reach the middle. If there's one in the middle, then that's your median. If there's two in the middle, then you go halfway between. If n is odd, well, if I cancel two off either side as I get to the middle, there'll only be one left in the middle. So the median will be in the list. The only time it won't be in the list is if I've got two different numbers either side and I've got to go halfway between. So that's when n is even. So that implies that if n is odd, then yes, I agree that the median of the list is in the list. So p does imply q. We have got a sufficient condition. So we've eliminated both b and d from our options. Okay, so now I need to go backwards. I need to assume Q and prove P. That's the necessary part of it. So I'm going to assume that the median of the list is one of the numbers in the list. And then I either need to show that N is odd or I need to disprove it with a counterexample. Well, actually, this one's pretty easy. I can disprove it with a counterexample. So let's take the numbers 1, 2, 2, 3. If I calculate the median of these, I cancel one off from either side and I have to go halfway between two and two. That is still two. So the median is one of the numbers in the list, but N is even. So Q does not imply P. So it is not a necessary condition. Even also works for this. So the correct answer here is C because it is sufficient, but it's not necessary. So this is kind of the idea that you want to be applying for both if and only if statements and necessary and sufficient conditions. It's just proving both ways or disproving. You start at one, prove the other, and then potentially do it backwards, depending on what the question's asking for. But yeah, you just want to break down the statement if and only if into what it actually implies, that directional logic, the same with necessary and sufficient. Okay, and there we have it. Hopefully this breakdown's made it a little bit easier for you to understand some of these logic statements and give you a bit more confidence to tackle them if they come up in the exam. Now, the Team UA paper two has a lot of these on them, so it's worth practicing a lot of those second papers so that you get really good at these logic questions. Even if you're not sitting the Team UA, it would be really good to prep now, and then when it comes to doing step, you'll have a bit of a head start. Again, if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a thumbs up and consider subscribing if you wanna see more content like this. But as always, thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one.